Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is decoding reality, and my guest is an old friend, Howard Eisenberg, medical doctor who also received a master's degree at McGill University in Montreal for his dissertation on the psychology of telepathy. He is author of Inner Spaces, Parapsychological Explorations of the Mind, and most recently, Dream It to Do It, The Science and the Magic. Howard lives in Ontario, Canada, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Howard. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Hi, Jeffrey. It's my pleasure, too given how far back we go and our mutual passions. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I can't remember exactly when we first met. I think it was in Canada, and I suspect it was many decades ago. Uh, I'm not sure how many, maybe as long ago as 50 years. It's in that, it's in that ballpark, because you, you were in your program at the university, and I was at McGill, both crafting our own programs in our you know, passionate at the time of parapsychology, which has continued from both of us in many respects. So it is almost half a century ago. Yeah. Well, your first book, Inner Spaces, as I recall, came out in 1977. Uh, and my first book, The Roots of Consciousness, came out in 1975. So we both sort of emerged uh, uh, at, at the same time with a strong interest in, in parapsychology. And I think it's, it's quite interesting that you did a master's degree working under Donald Hebb, who I remember it was the president at one point of the American Psychological Association, who... who uh, spoke publicly about uh, his interest in telepathy, I guess, based on your research. That's right, because before that, he had gone on record. It's in print. I actually have a quotation in my book to it, where he said he rejects all the evidence of parapsychology a priori in advance. It didn't matter what it seemed like because it was impossible to him. So after my research, yes, he recanted. <laughs> Yeah, he said, uh, if I remember correctly, he might make an exception for short-distance telepathy. Exactly. That's how he put it at the time. But obviously, it was the paradigm change, usually. Let's talk about some of that initial research. You were basic, basically, you demonstrated the existence of telepathy working under a uh, thesis advisor who thought it was impossible. <laughs> <laughs> right. He was, uh, at the time, too, he was chairman of the department. And um, I was working more immediately with Professor Donald Don Derry, uh, who was his junior. Um, and ironically, I think I told you, it was, uh, or I have it in the book, it was Dr. Hebb's personal secretary who had the honor <laughs> or burden of having to type up my, my master's thesis. Um, and she's the one who actually brought it to his attention in the beginning. She says, Professor Hebb, you were wrong. <laughs> Telepathy is real. Um, so um, it was really an amazing time to, to be there. And part of the reason that I chose to do it at McGill was because of his strong rejection of it a priori. Uh, I've always been, I guess, pretty principled <laughs> and, and uh, don't just simply conform. It, it has to make you no know, sense or appeal to me in some way. And I took it on, honestly, as a challenge and uh, naively in the sense that I had hoped in pursuing a successful research program in getting an official degree from the university. And it was the first postgraduate degree in Canada for research on in parapsychological areas. I had hoped it would open things up for other people. It didn't do that. I mean, it's taking a long time, you know, first to get out of what I call the materialistic reductionist paradigm of reality. Very, very difficult. 
One of the things that you write about in your new book, Dream It to Do It, is, is that this worldview, the very existence of something like telepathy, suggests that many, many other things that we assume about the nature of reality are not correct. That's right. I mean, at one point, many of us who are also in the field of, of research, uh, including myself at one point, uh, thought that maybe the medium for telepathic communication is some type of unknown energy. Um, and it was also of a different category because it, it didn't seem to be any type of barrier that could block it, unlike electromagnetic radiation, nor did it um, obey the inverse uh, square law of diminishing with distance. Uh, nevertheless, that's kind of what we were playing with. Like maybe there's still some type of force we don't understand, not assuming we knew them all. Um, and then so there would be the, another part of our world, another part of our material world, just more exotic, more ephemeral, but still part of our world. And it's only in the last few years that I came to realize and flip it on its head and realize things like telepathy, precognition, psychokinesis, uh, and all the other various terms we've used for these things and the popular things like clairvoyance and poltergeist, maybe they're not just glimpses of something else. Maybe they're revealing what is <laughs> and what we're otherwise thinking is more conventional, familiar and uh, accepted, the material realm. Maybe that is not so real strange enough. And maybe the problem in our past psychology research is that it's sort of like we're trying to chase our own shadows. And the more we move, the more it moves, so to speak. So for me, it was like quite a flipping of the perspective, even though I, I long been interested in the, if I could put it, powers or, or properties, capacities of the mind, um, and very much involved, too, in the materialist reductionist line of research. I, my master's degree was in experimental psychology, not clinical. Um, my first paper was in science at the age of 21 uh, for neurophysiological research. Um, so I was very much, you know, in that realm. And I have a popular YouTube video called Ramp Up Your Brain Power, which has had over 100,000 views. So like very much too working with the brain. And of course, in my work as a physician, working in the psychiatric arena, uh, I had to look at things like how chemicals can modulate brain function and some of the other ways to do it. So it wasn't that I wasn't interested or ignoring that realm, very deeply immersed in it. And I did not expect to come out at the other end completely. So I, I, I was playing with the idea even back in inner spaces that, that the brain, as we understand it physically, is not the generator, the origin of consciousness. Back then, I was thinking, as others have suggested in the past, like Henri Bergson and, and James, that maybe it was more like a receiver, something that receives a signal, but is not the source of the signal. So just like a radio that may be on at the moment to a certain station, and if something happens to that radio, it falls off, the batteries die, doesn't mean the signal's gone. If you have another radio, you turn at that time, you'll hear the rest, you know, of the program. So that was kind of the model I was working with. And now I've evolved to, uh, and I, I think evolves is the right word. I think the brain still plays a part, obviously, in our reality, but it's not the cause. And it's like a reducing valve. So it, it's not just a filter, excuse me, a receiver. It's very much filtering what we receive. And it's two ways. It's not just that, you know, the brain allows us to receive things selectively after it's filtering, but we can also upload <laughs> our intentions <laughs> to another realm, which greases the wheels of probability towards manifestation. I hope this makes sense. It sounds as if what you're saying is that it would be very useful if we redefined what it meant to be human. That and, and beyond. You know, I mean, the, the, the mystical conception of reality is oneness of the allness, that everything ultimately is one. Um, and, I, and I think that is, as I understand it conceptually, and we have speaking, you know, intellectual conceptual terms, it's, it's a pretty good model. And I, and I work with the model in terms of something called oceanic consciousness. And so the oneness of the allness is sort of the, the ocean, of which is everything. It's an infinite ocean, so to speak. And just like the ocean as we know it, periodically has waves on the surface of it. And over time, those waves change. Some become smaller and disappear into the body of the ocean. New ones emerge. 
Sometimes there's, there's huge ones, like even things like tsunamis and so on. But they all come out of the same base, the same, in a sense, existence, if you like. And so I think ourselves, as human beings, come back to your point of redefining ourselves, I think we are like temporary extensions, waves, projections, if you like, of the underlying cosmic, you know, sea of consciousness, we sometimes call it universal mind, some would call it God. In other words, we are sparks of the divine. Yes, yes. You know, and, and there are so many, as you know, references to uh, in the religious writings saying almost exactly that. Uh, you know, if I work with the New Testament, for example, you know, the kingdom of God is within you. These things I do, you shall do too. Um, uh, or if we go back, you know, to the ancient Hindu writings, you know, the Atman Brahman, um, it comes from so many places. And it finally just crystallized for me into like literally another way totally of experiencing and conceptualizing reality. And I should add too the, the former, I mean experiencing it too, not just conceptualizing. So like this, this book was a whole, you know, into the trip in itself. Um, from beginning the physical manuscript process to the actual uh, physical, by the way, publication was five months. Now, as you know, many, many years before that, I was, you know, feeding my mind and reflecting on various things. But it was an incredible spurt because when it started coming, it was almost like channeling. Um, I had not thought of certain concepts, certain ways to illustrate things, certain phraseology. It fortunately, it, it just started to come and very challenging in a pandemic environment, as you can imagine. One of the concepts that seems to be very important in your book is the a notion of maya as, as it comes out of the Hindu tradition, which is the, the, the idea that we're trapped in an illusion of, uh, of some sort. And it's never clear to me when I discuss the concept of maya with, with different scholars, just what is that illusion? And uh, how do we know when we think we've reached some kind of uh, enlightenment, how do we know that isn't also yet another level? of the illusion. First, to illustrate how Maya could be illusion and not to some intellectual concept or foreign concept, but something we actually can experience, we understand what, it's, what it means in our experience. So the way I would relate it would be your dreams. Some of our dreams, for some of us at times, are phenomenally vivid and realistic. And we truly do not believe during the dream that we're just dreaming. It isn't until we wake up or someone wakes us up because we're, you know, disturbed and they sense it on the outside to bring us back and comfort us. So that's kind of what I mean by how we get entrapped in our experience and thinking this is the reality. So obviously it's a perception, it's an experience. It doesn't mean it's the reality. Back to your other question, which is, so how do you then know <laughs> when you've seen through the reality, so to speak, and reality re really as it is? And that goes back to my chapter two. The only thing you can absolutely know, which, you know, partly goes back to, in a more popular terms, uh, Descartes, cookie of a sum, I think, therefore I am. Um, when I looked at everything, it's the only thing. And you're welcome to challenge me on this, by the way. Uh, I mean it. Um, it's the only thing we can't doubt. Like just doubting itself means there's existence, there's awareness. You talk about awareness of awareness and uh, the idea that uh, if I'm aware of the fact that I'm aware, or as uh, Descartes put it, I think, therefore I am, uh, th there's a funny paradox in there that you highlight, the, the idea that the knower and the known are somehow both the same person, and yet uh, the knower... Uh, how do you put it? That the, the known can't be the knower. Uh, sort of the other way around, but you're close. <laughs> so, so the knower is not the same as that which is known. Or, 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 you know, the source of awareness is not the same thing as what you're aware of. So, for example, trying to bring it back to earth terms <laughs> more conventionally. Um, so in terms of, for example, our own personalities, um, even our own physicality in terms of our appearance, we look in a mirror or, you know, if we're in a photograph or whatever, um, and our own sense, even kinesthetically, internally, of how we experience our physical being. That's all stuff we're aware of. 
And one exercise, as you may know, I have in the book is when you just stand in front of a mirror for a few moments and just look at the face and you realize you recognize your face, I hope, <laughs> uh, but it's not you. You just recognize the face and you can cause certain expressions to change if you want to, but it's not you. That's a different level. So there's different levels of awareness and awareness that you're not just your ego. You are your ego, but you're not just your ego. It's more like all the world's a stage where we're players on it and you can switch roles once you understand this. When you say the knower and the known, the, the known includes the whole universe. And one might say, well, I, who I am, is one tiny little speck inside of this big universe. But, but on the other hand, it's as if this big universe is just something that's inside of me. So, but when you say inside of me, that's me like ego. Me. No, no, I don't okay. mean ego me. Um, so, but there's no me though in this. Like, like when you really let yourself immerse yourself in the spaciousness of consciousness, the universal mind, there isn't that sense of me. Like, like the waves of the ocean, going back to that metaphoric uh, description of it, they're, they're not permanent. They're very temporary. They're always changing. They're coming and they're going. So, so the me is not a permanent thing. Right. I suspect the me will uh, pass away when this body dies. But the, uh, or maybe not. I've, after all, done quite a bit of research. Well, you're the, ex you're the expert. Yeah, you're the expert in that area. Uh, but I don't think it's the same. I think once, once we die, it's, uh, we do survive. We have a sense of identity, but it's nothing like the identity we have in the body. Correct. Because it's not as in a sense, constricted in, in, that, in that way. So correct. Uh, another, you know, uh, resource that I found helpful in conceptualizing this as part of, say, how it crystallized eventually a few years ago for me as I was writing in this book is Alan Watts' um, a, a, um, sort of suggestion to help us understand with our finite minds that maybe God being solitary, knowing everything, they look at everything, had a need to dream up people, the world, for stimulation, entertainment, company, so to speak. Um, and in that model, which I think has some truth in it, it's a simple way of putting it, th there's a, an essential need for the dreamer, the great dreamer, not to simply wake up and then be suddenly alone again. So uh, again, me is something that we obviously inhabit and it's meaningful to us. Uh, but it's only a very small portion of what reality really is and what we could potentially still experience and work with. I have read uh, in, in some accounts and it's made sense to me uh, at moments in my life. I felt it very strongly, Howard, that we are in some sort of a relationship with the divine, which it, it suggests that we are needed by the divine just as much as we need that in our lives. Exactly. So, you know, one way, again, is referencing that metaphorically is that there's boredom. And what do we do when we're bored? We daydream. And, and if God is universal mind and source of everything, maybe God dreams too, right in the part of the dream. It, it doesn't um, reduce, how should I say, the reality of it, to call it that way. It's just part of reality. It, it's our sense of reality, which is constraining. Reality is not constrained. We're the ones in our models that constrain it. On, on the other hand, I've heard other people say, no, God is perfect. God doesn't need us. And, and I think, well, there's a paradox, which is nothing you can say about God is actually true. Well, <laughs> to be aware, there has to be something you're aware of. So for God consciousness to be aware, there has to be something to be aware of. Going back to, yes, I think, if, and I'm simplifying it, obviously, we need God, God needs us. We need each other, so to speak. I like that thought. I think uh, one could pursue it in, in many directions. Uh, the way I like to pursue it is to say that God really needs us or desires for us to become the best versions of ourselves. 
And I believe that too, by the way. And um, as you may have picked up uh, on my book, because there's a lot in there, I wrote it because I feel called right now to write it. Uh, this had nothing to do with my academic career, nothing to do with financial earnings. I, I just sensed how could I not. Uh, so many crises we're dealing with, and, and some in advance of the popular awareness of it, unfortunately, a sensitivity I have, which is not a welcome gift, by the way. Um, so I just felt I had to do this. And, and my intention was as a global wake-up call, because I think this is so not what is right, what has to be, uh, on any level as you want. And if, on either the divine level, I do not believe the great dreamer wants this. It's just like when we have dreams, we don't want to have nightmares. We'd rather have pleasant dreams. So many of the problems that we face on this planet, and they seem to be compounding. I noticed I was out under the sky you know, looking at the stars last night, and it, I realized that when I was a child over half a century ago, the sky was much clearer. You could see many more stars. Yeah. And, and you know, people all over the world could sort of see the same sky, obviously different segments of it in different parts of the globe, but they could see sort of the same sky. It was something in a way that was unifying, you know, as, as opposed to what's happened with, you know, the smartphone era, where for me, we have this disunifying effect, disconnecting us. And here's the irony, you know, people think it, it still connects us. We're in the connected world right now. You can talk to almost anyone, anywhere, um, and also, you know, do video as well as we are in part. But there's a cost. There's a real cost to it, cost to our consciousness. And that cost seems to be the deterioration of uh, life on the planet. I, I think you pointed out we're living through a mass extinction at, at the moment. And uh, to a large degree, we're in denial. Yeah, I also think um, broadly, cause my psychotherapy background, we have now mass emotional dysregulation from all of the crises we're facing. Uh, many are existential crises. They're not just hurdles to get through um, and compounding almost all at the same time. I don't want to depress people by listing what they are, like a laundry list. And sadly, it may well increase between now and when anyone, you know, may be listening to this message. But it is a reality that almost all the fundamental aspects of this conventional level of reality as we know it, as we've experienced it, as many of us want to still have. It's all now in flux tremendously, and, and existential is not an exaggeration. Um, in biblical terms, yeah, we're at end times. But I think there's an opportunity. I think there's a window of opportunity. Back to my attempt to say to have, write this book as a wake-up call. It depends on our choices. And I'm trying to wake people up to realize. It is an expression I use in the books, you know, that the only way out is in. It doesn't seem logical. It seems like, you know, it's the opposite. No, no, you got to go in. And in my book, too, as you remember, I, I, I talk about not only is the notion that the physical head brain produces consciousness wrong by all the evidence I'm aware of, and we can go into that if you want to, but even the notion that there is a physical brain that produces consciousness in humans is wrong because we have these three now. There's the head brain, the heart brain. And the microbiome, the, the bacteria in our large intestine, all of which have nerves that can control brain function, all of which produce their own neurotransmitters that can change brain function. So, you know, in no way, again, this is just from the brain. <laughs> You're bringing up something very interesting, which is that we don't really appreciate the complexity of our own bodies. And yet, at the same time, I think you're suggesting even the body and everything physical isn't quite what we think it is either. Both. <laughs> yes. It's complex. But, but you seem to be suggesting, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Howard, that, that if we are in this generation and the next generation, it's going to be incumbent upon people in the next, let us say, the next 50 years, to use a round number, if, if we're going to reverse the uh, terrible destruction that's going on on our planet, it's going to be up to these generations to do it. And you seem to be suggesting that the only way we're going to get there is if if we 
come upon, if we are able as a, a global society to enter into a more accurate understanding of reality itself. That's right. And understand it's a shared experience. And then to have a more cooperative and collaborative attitude towards each other. Um, you know, weirdly enough, and I'll, I'll say weirdly because at one time I scoffed at it myself, that the, the underlying principle that connects us all potentially as humans, potentially, is love. And that goes back, if I'll relate back to the physical part, to the heart brain. The heart brain, we know physically, the cardiac heart, it has its own neurons, its own nervous system. It has its own memory system. This is true. It produces not only neurotransmitters, but even oxytocin, the so-called love hormone, comes from the heart. Um, so we need to be more guided on this level of reality, because I think of it as levels, by heart-based wisdom, heart-based living, heart-based compassion. When I said earlier that I partly scoffed at the notion of, of love being so important, I was thinking back, believe it or not, to R.M. Buck's you know, experience with cosmic consciousness. A psychiatrist wrote about it several decades ago, and he came to the conclusion, he, he said that the underlying principle of the universe is love. At the time, I thought, like, interesting, but I think you lost it a bit, you know? Um, very fanciful, you know, thinking that way. And then I came to understand, and recently, it took me a long time, <laughs> slow learner, perhaps, love's what connects us. That is what connects us. And I don't think it's just, you know, physical if you can hug somebody or be intimate with somebody. Just the feeling, you know, of, of caring, of, in a sense, the unity underneath our you know, costumes. It's, it's very, very powerful, very healing. And we need more of that. I don't even think, back to what you said about, you know, other generations, 50 years, not to be pessimistic, I don't think we have anywhere near that long. Uh, by any projections you want to look at, if, if you look at, you know, just the projection for a global climate crisis, we don't have that long. We don't even have 10 years. Here where we have catastrophic changes, um, civilizational collapse, potentially, no joke. Um, other things, without going through a long list, the sperm count and quality in men around the world is declining, our ability to reproduce. I mean, th there are so many aspects of, for me, the writing's on the wall. This is it. We need to make some phenomenal changes now, collectively. I don't think it's a choice or else, again, we're in the nightmare realm. Given that most of the people who are uh, potentially listening to this videotape or other people in the world who you're trying to address because the problem is so urgent, they're very busy taking care of their families, making sure that their children are healthy, that they have food on the table, that they can pay their rent or uh, maintain whatever their essential needs are. They're not really inclined to think in terms of consciousness or even psychology, let alone mysticism. How are you going to reach people? Well, first, you're, you're totally correct that, that that's not their inclination uh, at all. And we live in a very distracted world. I mean, again, as I say, sort of the smartphones, you know, one example have greatly contributed to that, but it's not the only way we're distracted. And then the ego itself, again, in a sense, is a distraction and, and, and an entrapment. Um, people have to be somehow educated. And this is one reason why I'm glad to be sharing this opportunity with you. Thank you. They need to be educated to understand that the horrors we're experiencing in the world, I mean, there's so many of them in so many different levels and areas of the world. It, it's not an accident. I mean, whether you're religious or not, don't believe in end times. We still are on the verge of, of a nightmarish existence for ourselves and the sentence that we have any. And we have a chance to change things. We know there's some things that are wrong. We know we haven't had a good relationship with our environment. So global climate change is one aspect of that, but it's not the only aspect. We've also poisoned a lot of the water, a lot of the areas that otherwise would be used for agricultural reasons as well. We have an awful lot of radiation waste building up, nuclear power, and no safe way, totally safe way to dispose of it. Uh, again, there's just so many you know, different levels of this. I, I don't want to go through as a, a long list. But you need to come to the realization that it's not only 
so bad in so many ways and overwhelming, we need to take a pause and take a breather, partly physiologically, which I talk about in my book too, in terms of the benefit of stimulating the vagal nerve as a way to downregulating the nervous system quickly, within a minute or two it's fast, with no chemicals, very quickly, but also in our consciousness and our awareness, like to detach from the outside world. One of the great teachings of many uh, of the philosophical religious traditions, particularly Buddhism, is about non-attachment. Don't get too attached to things. Uh, the metaphor I like, again, from the Buddhist teachings is to think that everything we're aware of, our sensations, our feelings, our thoughts, intentions, things going on in our environment we pick up with our sensory system, they're all, again, objects of our awareness. They're not us. And to use the uh, symbolism of clouds in the overhead sky, sometimes the overhead sky is very cloudy. The clouds are dense and fairly dark. Sometimes the wind movement is, is low, and so it takes quite a while for the clouds to move on. But eventually they do. The clouds clear. The sun comes out again. So this notion again of you know non-attachment, or from the Bible, you know the things too shall pass. Um, so I think it's really important to know. And even though they may not be inclined at all towards consciousness or, or any type of religion, but they do know they're suffering right now themselves, and they know there's a greater suffering, which a lot of us want to be in denial about because it's just too much. But they know that, and they don't like it. And they can't feel confident right now about the future for themselves and or their families, if they have them. Or their work, their careers, their businesses. Not now. You can't be confident, particularly right now. So maybe it's worth this notion of just a breather. And I think in that breather, they'll start experiencing something different. I may have shared with you, I, I'm producing an audiobook version of my book, too, shortly, to give people more of an experience of what I call the spaciousness of consciousness to help them. Those, again, that maybe are not, as you say, intellectually as minded or interested in these particular subjects. But that's, a, that's the way I think it, it has to start, just the awareness. That's a good starting point. I know in the subtitle of your book, you refer to science and magic. And I know you're referring to the art of manifesting, the art of really changing the world. And, and you offer a, a number of examples of people who, who did that right out of their dreams, as a matter of, of, of fact, which is your title, Dream It to Do It. That It sounds as if you're saying we, we could, as a culture, culture or as a species, pull the rabbit out of the hat, do something magical to change our reality. And, and maybe all it would take is one very powerful magician to change it for everybody. But I suspect you're th really thinking, no, it requires a, at least a minimal number of people to, to be able to envision a different world. Yes, I think it takes a minimum number of people. I don't have any quantitative sense of what that is. It doesn't have to be, though, the, the masses, broadly speaking. And my book's fairly intellectual. Um, I'm not doing it to impress anyone. I just wanted it to be rigorously scientific and logical um, and, and, and correct. Hopefully it is in, in all the things that you know I was discussing. Um, but I realize, again, it, it's a serious book. And, and why would it not be a serious book? It's about how reality works. And particularly at a time of crisis, when I have to scream, wake up, there's a fire. You know, uh, uh, to use Greta Thunberg's term, our house is on fire. When I think about um, our destiny as a species, it occurs to me that, uh, uh, and I'm drawing now upon, in fact, a, a video recently aired by one of my mentors, Arthur M. Young, the inventor of the Bell helicopter. I, I interviewed him long ago, but we released it recently about free will, determinism, and fate. And he, he suggested that reality is like an Oreo cookie in, in a way, that um, we have free will, but uh, it's constrained on one end by determinism, we we have to operate within the laws of physics. You've pointed out the you know the the wonders of of the human body that we're still discovering. That that's part of our our constraints is uh, those laws. But then there's also fate, 
uh, destiny. For all I know, the human species is already destined to, to become extinct. I mean, practically every species on this planet will eventually become extinct. The sun will go out at some point. Well, th this is also the Buddhist concept of impermanence, right? Everything is impermanent. Everything changes, or Heraclitus, you know, doing cost of this change. Uh, but I respectfully disagree with the two points you referenced about him, and I think he's brilliant, by the way. I, I read his book many, many years ago and loved it. Um, on determinism, first of all. The problem here is, again, uh, getting into Maya and illusion. So, I, you know, an example I provide of this early in my book is how people, especially in my case with my young son, when he was around 10 or so, how they are taught in martial arts, his was Taekwondo, but it's in karate and some of the other ones, to smash barehanded a wooden board and break it. And he did this at a demonstration when he was around 10 and I was witnessing as a parent, it was uh, an opportunity for the parents to see how their children were faring. And I did not know what he was gonna do in advance. And when I saw it, I was impressed. And every one of the little kids, including him, first blow, the board split. And because I'm also an MD, a <laughs> doctor, afterwards when it was over, I looked at his hands to see like if there's any abrasions or if it's red or bruising or anything of that nature. I also asked him, you know, did it hurt you? And then I was, he said no to all this, by the way. There was no sign of any injury. He felt nothing subjectively. It was, you know, discomforting him. I had to ask, how'd they teach you to do that? And this is important, back to determinism, right, and physical reality and laws and all that. He said they didn't teach them to hit the board. They taught them to hit beyond the board. So that's my first point on determinism. And, and regarding the second one, uh, you know, about what, what's our, our fate. First of all, I don't believe in fate per se, because fate implies um, something that's fully... Um, shaped in terms of how it will manifest or, or happen. And I don't believe it's like that. I, I think there's an, an intrinsic uh, randomness in reality by intention, back to what I said earlier. Uh, if the dreamer awakens, it can no longer enjoy maybe the fantasy of a good dream. <laughs> so it may not want to awaken prematurely. <laughs> But since we're looking at the issue of decoding reality, and since you've done parapsychology research, we have to come to terms with all the research and precognition that certainly suggests that, at least to some degree, the future is actually knowable. Yes. And as I said, uh, I have my own experiences with it, not always, as I said, as a gift in terms of some things I you know, pick up in advance on. Um, but if you then look more broadly, at reality as I do, as it's multidimensional. It's not just one or two levels. It's multidimensional. Um, let me come back to precognitions for a moment. Uh, and this is something that just came to me symbolically a long time ago. Let us say you're in a, a city like New York City, um, and you're at the pedestrian level and the sidewalk level, and you see all the you know busyness around you and a lot of tiny, tall buildings as well. And then if you go into one of those buildings, tall ones, and you take the elevator up, you know, way up, and, and you look down at where you were before, you see where you were before, perhaps, I mean, assuming the visuals work here, but you also see so much more. Now, they're both in the same reality. In a sense, they're sort of in the same time space. It isn't like radically different that way either. It just suddenly has different perspective. Now, if you're walking back to the first one, example along the sidewalk, you can only see so far ahead of you. So, for example, there, there might be a, a major vehicle crash or a fire, you know, a quarter mile down or something that you have no idea of. And maybe if you're driving, you know, you want to drive that way. Or if you're walking, again, you change your plans. But when you're up on that vertical dimension, much higher up, you can see that future in a sense that if you're at the pedestrian level, you're yet to experience. That makes sense? So it's up at dimensions. That, that makes good sense. And uh, I think we're at a point in our discussion where we can see a lot of fires up ahead, so to speak. You, you, you've used that metaphor already. The world is on fire. So you can go in almost any direction and, and there will be uh, these dangers that we need to confront. So uh, coming back to the uh, use of the word magic. You, you've pointed out that humans have this capability. We can visualize 
things differently than they are now and and we can uh, make changes based on our visualizations, based on our dreams. But it seems to me, as a person who I, I feel like I've been living my dream in a very positive way. Well, I think you were too. They said earlier, in some ways, you're a manifestation of the example of my book. <laughs> I feel the same way about you, Howard. Uh, but I also have the sense that maybe... It works so well in my case because I it was part of something larger, something you might think of in terms of as fate or destiny. I'm not sure that I can now, therefore, since I've shown that I'm able to visualize and manifest things, I can't just sit down and, and visualize the end of global warming or, or, or the end of ongoing pollution on this planet or, or the end of war. Or the end of uh, all all sorts of uh, forms of uh, oppression. Well, I'll go back to the example of don't try and smash through the board. Strike beyond the board. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm very aware, and as I said, I could go through a much longer laundry list of all the ills, existential threats facing us at many different levels and simultaneously. Um, so I'm very aware of that more than I think than most people are and not to brag about it. It's painful. So I, it's not something I enjoy, but despite that, I'm still able to imagine a possibility that we have a window of opportunity to turn things around majorly. I didn't even know when I started to write this book, if it would end up even being published. I mean, again, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, there was political turmoil and uh, for so many other reasons. Uh, I thought people were so distracted. This is so the wrong time. And then they had, it felt like it's so the needed time, you know, to come out with this. Um, so to repeat what I'm saying, I think I'm very aware, painfully so more than many, of all the threats we have. And yet I'm able to still envision the possibility. And if I told you some of the ways I envision it, you would question my sanity, <laughs> even though we're talking some pretty far out things uh, right now. Um, but I'll give you one example, and I hope I can keep my composure as I do this, because it just happened yesterday. As with yourself, I sent in a number of complimentary copies to people who I thought might be interested or influential, going back to my wanting it to be a wake-up call. One of the people I sent it to, who I will not name, because it, it wouldn't be fair to, but he's one of the wealthiest, most famous people in the world, and by good reputation, not, not as a robber baron, not as an autocrat. And from some recent uh, writings of his, and also some uh, webcasts I saw, I was really impressed that despite his materialistic success and obviously interests, he also had a deep concern about where we're going from heart-based wisdom, as I was talking about. I could sense that. So I took a shot. I wrote him a letter. I sent a copy of my book by registered mail to him, not knowing if he would ever get it. Imagine he has so many gatekeepers. He's a very busy person. He wouldn't know me. I don't see any envelopes MD. Um, it's my sloppy medical writing. <laughs> wasn't even fancy in that sense. But just yesterday, I received a FedEx envelope. And in that FedEx letter was a small envelope, just my name on it, Howard. And inside was a personal thank you note from him of how touched he was, and said some other really good and personal things. So here's my point. The, the likelihood that someone like me could reach someone like him w without a lobbyist, without a friend intervening or anything of that nature, would not be high. And most people, first of all, wouldn't imagine doing it. And if they did imagine it, <laughs> they'd say it's crazy, and they wouldn't even bother doing it. But again, I don't just dream it. I do it. And I've had many experiences in my life that have shown me there's a correlation. As I all say in my book, I think there's an intrinsic randomness, as I told you. So I'm not suggesting with manifestation and magic that all we have to do is have an intention or a visualization, and it just would be that way. But I do believe we also live, if you want to put it this way, contrary to fatalism, in a probabilistic universe. And, you know, the... All the data of quantum mechanics is totally in that direction. So much so, like, like there is no thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a probable like zone uh, manifesting in a sense. Um, and it's intrinsic. It's not just because of a limitation of our, our technology. So I, 
I think reality is like that. I think there's a certain intrinsic randomness. So I do believe, though, by our visualization, by our intention, and importantly, by the way, believe, we can influence the probabilities. Is it like, again, fatalistic, absolute control, cause and effect? No. But is it meaningful? Is it a high correlation? Yes. And to give a personal example that you know, your, your viewers and listeners can, can relate to, placebo effect. So, so many of us at various times need medications for things. And when these drugs are going through their experimental trials to prove to the regulatory authorities that they're legitimate, that they really work, that they're also safe, in these so-called drug trials in this research, they compare it to what they call placebo, something they know that chemically is inert. Some of them refer to them as sugar pills, that there's nothing really pharmacological going on. And it could be in a capsule form, in a tablet form, as a syrup. It doesn't matter. Uh, it would look like the real drug and be labeled as such, but it's not. And in these placebo uh, trials for these new drugs to be developed and licensed, there's always a large group of people, without getting the real drug, the placebo, who have the desired benefits that the drug was designed for. And a number of them, too, I might add, report undesirable side effects. This is true. Physical side effects from placebos. So, so that's something maybe that, you know, more perhaps common day people can relate to. Placebo effect, mind over matter. Well, it does suggest to me, Howard, that even though none of us is capable of changing the world, uh, we are all capable of making small improvements in our lives. If everybody were to just try to become 1% a, a better person every day. Over the course of a year, that would add up to being 365% uh, change. It could be enormous. That's right. And, you know, I even give the example of, you know, we have this poetical, you know, uh, description, so to speak, of the eyes being like the windows of the soul. And there is actually evidence when we make eye contact with people, things are happening too on a neurochemical level. For example, even with dogs, if you know this research, they found that when uh, owners are looking into the eyes of their pet dogs and the dogs are looking back at their beloved owners and they look at oxytocin levels, they both get an oxytocin you know, hit from that mutual engagement. So if we would all become more uh, conscious, aware, and appreciative when we see other people's eyes, to connect to them like, like young, you know, babies when they're out, let's say, in a stroller, a carriage, and certain pre-pandemic times, you know, automatically are looking in people's eyes. And a lot of very serious adults, if they catch, you know, their eyes, they suddenly relax and they get into a smile. So if, if we even did something that simple, and, and we're restricted now in various parts of the world with the pandemic with masks, and a lot of us are really upset about that and, you know, keeping our distance, we're forgetting about using the eyes. You still have eye contact with people. What a good point. When we smile, we change our own physiology. You're smiling. In fact, you may know there was some research, if you just take like a pen or a pencil and you put, you know, between your, your jaws, that it causes a certain stretch in your muscles that raises affect, raises the mood. But more so if you do it in real life. I mean, is there so, you know, serious or glum or tuned out? So like, just things like that, like, you know, waking up more, to even just this level of our existence and connecting more will make a world of difference. As I said right now, we're not only do we have all these threats, but we're very fractionated. People don't trust others. They don't care about others. And worse, a lot of them have now this hatred and want to destroy others. It's again, mass emotional dysregulation, almost like mass insanity to me. So some of the simplest things that we can do, such as opening our eyes and looking into the eyes of other people, can be among the most powerful. Yes, very much so. Well, that is a great lesson, Howard Eisenberg. I'm delighted that we've had this conversation. I can share that kind of wisdom with our viewers that just keep your eyes open and, and be willing to see other people for who they actually are. What a wonderful lesson, Howard. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you, Jeffrey, again so much for this opportunity. Thank you and be well. Thank you. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you.
for being with us. Thank you.